Thank you very much. Uh, can I be heard over there all right? This is okay, good. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me to give this talk. Uh, I have uh, an interest in this topic, even though I've never actually seen a case of chronic traumatic encephalopathy. I hope that you find this topic as interesting as I do. Uh, disclaimer, for CME purposes, I have no commercial interest to disclose. However, my wife holds stock in uh, Pfizer, uh, which she inherited from her parents. The plan for this talk is about the first half, maybe to two-thirds, is what I'll call the narrative. It's a couple of great anecdotes and some pretty solid uh, neuropathology at this point uh, revolving around the concept of uh, CTE or chronic traumatic encephalopathy. And then uh, the, the, the last half is the problem with the narrative, which I think can be summed up in one word, which is epidemiology. Uh, and then the conclusions, which are just a couple of obvious things from the first two parts. Okay, so uh, arguably the most famous hit in football history occurred on November the 20th, 1960. What you see there is the guy in white is concrete Chuck Bednarik, and he hits Frank Gifford on the last play of the game and, uh, and, and separates uh, Frank from the football. It's recovered by uh, the Eagles and time runs out. Uh, so, um, and this meant that, well actually the, the Eagles then beat the Giants on the very next week, went to the, went to the uh, NFL championship game and Bednarik made the final tackle in that game and sat on Charlie Taylor for the final few seconds, didn't let him get up so they couldn't get another, it was on the eight yard line, they were eight yards from scoring and winning the game, but Bednarik tackled that guy and sat on him and the time ran out and, uh, and that was that. Now there are multiple still photographs of the uh, aftermath of this and the still, still photographs make Bednarik look very bad. Uh, you can however Google or whatever a grainy video of this sequence of events, about 10 or 15 seconds long. And uh, there's been an awful lot of interpretation of this given w uh, with various uh, points of view. Charlie Connerly, the, uh, the, the uh, quarterback of the New York Giants at the time, said it was a cheap shot and, w and criticized Bednarik for the rest of his life over this. Char uh, uh, Howard Cosell uh, re referred to this, so Gifford went on to uh, a long career in, in broadcasting, and uh, Cosell referred to it as a, as a cheap shot and a blindside hit on numerous occasions. Uh, I've looked at the, uh, the uh, video, and clearly not a blindside. Uh, Gifford saw him coming all the way, shoulder to shoulder hit, a good strong hit. Um, and I think what actually happened here is that uh, the field was icy, Gifford was dancing towards the sideline to try to get out of bounds and save some time, and when uh, Bednarik hit him, his, the back of his head hit this very icy, the frozen tundra, very hard, and uh, I think that's where he got his concussion. Now what uh, happened here was Gifford was knocked out for more than an hour, probably closer to two hours. He, he was still unconscious when he made it to the hospital. He stayed in the hospital several days. He missed the rest of this season. He stayed out the, re the entire following season. And when he came back, he no longer was a running back. He was a slot back or a, you know, a sort of wing back, one of these guys that, that was a receiver in the slot, sort of a new position at the time. He went on to uh, become a Hall of Famer. Um, and then he had this uh, fairly gaudy broadcasting career. He died in 2015, demented, and um, his family had a private autopsy arranged, and the details of that are not known in very much detail, but they did reveal that after whatever was done, that they, were, they received the diagnosis of chronic traumatic encephalopathy uh, from their privately arranged autopsy. Concrete Chuck Bednarik, very interesting guy, parents Slovenian, worked in the steel mills in uh, Bethlehem. Uh, he was three-time All-American at uh, Penn, I think. Um, waste gunner, multiply, uh, multiply, uh, multiple medals in World War II. Um, only missed three games in uh, 15 years. The last of the great two-way players. He played center 
and linebacker. He was called Concrete Charlie not because of the ferociousness of his tackles, but because he sold concrete in, uh, in the summertime as a way to uh, supplement his salary, although one pundit did say that uh, he was a man who was as hard as the concrete he sold. Um, uh, he was voted in 1969 by a group of people in the, in, the, in the pundit game, the greatest center of all time. Now this is interesting if you consider what's about to follow. Um, uh, he died in 2015, he, Hall of Famer, and everybody said he was well until he died, and then his family said, well, he was demented uh, when he died. And again, he missed three games in uh, 15 seasons, roughly. I, I may be wrong about the 15, but in a lot of seasons. Okay, so the idea that repetitive head trauma uh, leads to some form of cognitive dysfunction is not new. In fact, actually, it goes back to uh, before Christ, I mean, you know, B.C. But at any rate, uh, the modern era sort of started in 1928 when Martland uh, came up with the uh, concept of punch drunk. In 1937, Millspa defined uh, an entity that he called dementia pugilistica. In 1966, uh, Miller introduced the term chronic traumatic encephalopathy. In 1967, Roberts interviewed or ex and examined 250 retired boxers and, and sort of described a clinical syndrome of a mixture of cerebellar pyramidal and extrapyramidal uh, symptoms. This was all in boxers. In 1973, Corsell has put together what I'm gonna call, briefly anyway, the classic and sort of static idea of chronic traumatic encephalopathy. He uh, described pathologically 15 cases that had neurofibrillary tangles, or NFTs. And uh, this was the first uh, neuropathologic description. I will give you the gross uh, description in a few slides here. And he described NFTs, neuron loss, and gliosis in the temporal lobe and the hippocampus. He distinguished dementia pugilistica from other neurodegenerative disorders, and he, he and his group went back after this publication and uh, immunohistochemically, no, must have, yeah, immunohistochemically went back and showed A beta deposition, which is the sort of, as you're probably all aware, sort of the, the, uh, the central hypothesis for how uh, Alzheimer disease gets started. Uh, they showed a beta de deposition in these brains as well. Not neuritic plaques, but the diffuse deposition of, of this uh, amyloid precursor. In the 90s, uh, the sort of modern form of uh, CTE was described by Hoff and Geddes but just in, a, just in one or two cases, okay, and again in boxers. And uh, they established the basic distribution of lesions in CTE as we now know them, and I'm gonna go into that in considerable detail in a minute. Everything changed in 2005 when Dr. Bennett Omalu, a uh, neuropathologist, well, actually a forensic pathologist who had neuropathology training, reported a case report. Now, one of the things that I kinda like about going through this history is, is that everybody sort of disdains and thinks that case reports are no good. And uh, you know, they just, they're, they're worthless. And this is a case report that for whatever reason, and I think it has something to do with sociology and social media and our 24-7 uh, coverage of everything sort of disastrous. Uh, but nevertheless, this is a case report that changed everything, okay? It just did. So he autopsied Mike Webster who probably now would be considered the best center of all time, uh, of the Pittsburgh Steelers, he did an autopsy on the brain, well, he did the entire autopsy on Mike Webster and published a case report in 2005 entitled, Chronic Traumatic Encephalopathy in a National Football League Player. And for all practical purposes, all hell broke loose. Okay, and then he did another one on another player in 2006 and he came up with about five more cases in 2010. Let's see. Ah, no, 
next, 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 next. Ah, okay. And I think these might have been the five. So Mike Webster was called Iron Mike. He grew up in Wisconsin. He was about six foot one and 200 pounds when he played center for the University of Wisconsin through a uh, exercise regimen and weight and strength development program that even NFL players thought was insane, he managed to turn himself into a six foot one, 250 pound guy, okay, who outworked everybody and he was clearly considered to be the strongest man in the NFL in his prime. And I don't think anybody contested that. And you can go on onto the web and find stories about his workout regimen and what he did and when he did it and he was, uh, to use a technical term that I'm sure is quite familiar to all of you in the psychiatry department, bonkers, okay, just absolutely bonkers. And um, he, he, uh, he played in, uh, he, he played in an enormous number of games consecutively. I've, I've forgotten the number at the moment, 1,500, something like that. He never missed a game. And, um, and he, he, he was nine-time All-Pro, Wore, won four Super Bowl rings, um, and spent his final two years at, uh, in Kansas City with the Chiefs. Retired from there, bought a big house in Kansas City, and very shortly thereafter started acting in a very bizarre fashion. Made terrible business decisions, started uh, losing money like mad. One of his sons observed him, this is a quote, peeing in the oven. Um, he started wandering off. Nobody could keep track of him. Uh, uh, his, his friends and, and colleagues tried to uh, help him. They tried very hard to help him. He was lo widely loved. Terry Bradshaw paid for him to have an apartment when he'd wander off. He wandered off. The owner of the Steelers put him up in a hotel for three months. He wandered off. He acquired guns. He would wave them in uh, public places. Uh, AR-15, Sig Sauer P-226s. Uh, he got into arguments with people. He slept in fields. He slept under uh, bridges. Um, he slept in a closet near the weight room in uh, Kansas City's Arrowhead Stadium. Uh, nobody could rein him in. He, his teeth started falling out, and he tried to glue them back into his mouth. Um, he, he just disintegrated. He completely disintegrated. And... Um, at the, he, he retired somewhere around the age of 38 or 40. At the age of 50, he died of a heart attack. And he came to autopsy in Emmett, in uh, Bennett, Bennett uh, Omalu's forensic lab in Pittsburgh. And uh, Omalu is a very detailed, very naive, interesting character who worked under a very famous forensic pathologist named Cyril Wecht. And um, he decided to do a full-fledged uh, forensic, full-fledged neuropathologic workup. He knew this history, so he, he knew there was something wrong with this man's brain. So he decided to work up the guy's brain. And uh, this isn't something that's done in very busy forensic centers in general. We work up in our forensic center, everybody, uh, to a full extent. Uh, we certainly examine everybody's brain. He had to get permission to examine Mike Webster's brain, but this guy, Cyril Weck, said, sure, go ahead and make me famous, which he did. Uh, so he examined the brain uh, and used uh, the approach of looking for something like Alzheimer's disease for it. And sure enough, at the age of 50, he found neurofibrillary tangles and a bunch of other abnormal things in an abnormal distribution and wrote the case report that I just told you about. Now. Uh, let's see, these other guys. I'll be darned. This isn't quite, oh yes, okay. So these other guys um, probably have interesting stories. I'll just mention that John Grimsley, um, no, I'll save that one. Uh, so then there are, um, the, these are all people that have autopsy confirmed uh, CTE. Junior Seau rapidly declined as soon as he, he's a Hall of Famer, he rapidly declined as soon as he quit uh, football. He had terrible short-term memory problems. 
and he shot himself in the chest so that his brain wouldn't, he arranged for his brain to be examined and then shot himself in the chest so that uh, his brain wouldn't be disturbed by how he had committed suicide. Uh, Justin Strelchek was another offensive lineman and, and companion of Mike Webster, and uh, he was the star of an Adam Sandler video that some of you might have seen called the Lonesome Kicker. They stole his uh, snow boot and taunted him in the video. Now, this is my favorite part of the talk, okay? So they made, uh, or this gal, Jean Marie Laskus, wrote a book about Omalu, okay, and at the end of this talk, you're gonna know a lot more about the neuropathology of CTE than you'll learn by reading this book. However, if you wanna learn about the sociology of Nigeria, the sociology of the NFL, or the sociology of big time academic neuropathology, and yes, there is such a thing, uh, then this book is for you. It's, it's a very interesting book, very, very interesting. And, and poor old Bennett, uh, while he started this off, he, he was naive as you could possibly imagine, and he very rapidly had this whole thing taken away from him by Anne McKee and the, and the powers that be in, in uh, academic neuropathology at Boston University. So Anne McKee, uh, she gives him full credit for getting it started, and she's, she's a fine neuropathologist as far as I can tell. But most of the rest of the progress in this field has been made out of Boston University and a few other places uh, since then. The other thing that I have to point out is that they made a movie, they made a movie in which the star and the protagonist, okay, you ready for this, is a neuropathologist. Ta-da! Okay, well, anyway, it, the movie, I think, disappeared without a trace, but nevertheless, I gotta, you know, I gotta, I gotta point this out, don't I? I think I do. Okay, so why did Omalo's case reports ignite the field? Well, football. I mean, you know, this, this is the first time that anybody had, had tied repetitive head injuries to, uh, to America's sport, okay? I'm from St. Louis, so I gotta tell you, baseball, is America's sport, okay? Not football, all right? But I seem to be losing that argument somehow, all right? Then the, these are sensational stories, I think you'll agree, and they're about famous people. I haven't told you about the NFL's response. This is the sociology of the NFL. I mean, you gotta read this book to understand how sleazy the NFL actually is. It's unbelievable. I mean, I'm, I'm assuming, I've got good citations for everything else for the rest of this talk. I'm assuming that this gal has written the truth in the book called Concussion. The first thing the NFL did was try to get neurosurgery to retract the case report. They demanded that, based on nothing, they demanded that he retract the case report. The second thing they did was they, they made real famous neuropathologist demand to see his slides and redo all the slides, which he did. He, gave, he, he said, well, fine, and, and they, all, they, they looked at his slides, they made their own slides, and they went, he's right. Then, then, <laughs> then, then um, they, didn't, and they, they denied Mike Webster, uh, first they denied him any kind of disability, then they denied it retroactively, and they continued until just recently to deny that that repetitive head trauma had anything to do with any kind of mental dysfunction in football. Of course, nobody has denied it for about 100 years in boxing. Uh, and it goes on and on. Oh, the head, of their, the head of their concussion task force, was he a neurologist? No. Was he a neurosurgeon? No. He was a rheumatologist. Okay, enough of that. Anyway, it's an interesting book. All right. Big money, big legal battles, big media, social and otherwise coverage. Okay, for the record, CTE pathology has now been described in the brains of deceased in each of these sports activities, careers, pathologies. And I won't read them all to you, but I will point out that there's been one basketball player who only played basketball who has had it, one baseball player who only played baseball who has had it, dwarf throwing, <laughs> what? Okay, and head banging, whether it's, whether, whether it's a, um, a, a, what, a pastime at music concerts or a secondary effect of certain kinds of pathologies like epilepsy or autism, it's been described. Okay, 
Now, now here's, I'm just going to, towards the end of the talk, we'll get into the epidemiology. But for, but for the moment, the real problem with this whole field is that the symptoms to, to this disorder are only determined in retrospect after you've had the patient's brain. And there, there isn't anything specific about the symptoms at all. They could just as easily be uh, Alzheimer's disease or, any, or depression or any number of things, okay? Uh, and there is no consensus criteria for the clinical diagnosis of CTE, okay? And even and another problem that you'll see in a moment is that CTE isn't in the international classification of diseases currently. So, I mean, you can't even code a death as CTE. So, I mean, so we got problems. All right. So the early pre clinical presentation of chronic traumatic encephalopathy, according to Anne McKee, is these things. And as you can see, I mean, they're reminiscent of AD, they're reminiscent of depression, and you guys probably can tell me what other things they're reminiscent of, but, but they're relatively nonspecific, and they're pretty common across the population as you get older. So, I mean, they're, they're, not, they're not that. And then in the later clinical presentation is just pretty much worsening of of the ones that are early. Now, the things that tend to stick out in the individual stories that we, we hear is the emotional instability, the lack of impulse control, the anger, uh, and things like that. Okay, the gross pathology has been known for quite some time and nobody has messed with that, okay? Decrease in the brain mass, cavum septum pellucidum, which is not correct Latin, as I'll point out in a minute, septal fenestrations, enlarged ventricles, atrophy, mammillary body atrophy, and depigmentation of the pigmented nuclei. Okay, and I'll just, just give you a little bit of this. The upper one is normal, the lower one is not normal, and you can see the enlargement of the ventricles. Then here you can see pretty easily on the, oh, on the left with the big red arrow, you can see the cavum septi pellucidi, okay, or cave of the septum pellucidum. I do this, to, I just point out it's not cavum septum pellucidum, my Jesuit training and one year of Latin won't allow me to let this pass, okay? And then you can see, uh, well here, let me, maybe I can do this. You're, no, yes, okay. Can you guys see the, the white arrow? All right, so this probably should be the hippocampus here and the lateral horns are quite enlarged and I can't really make out what that is. It's either the hippocampus or the amygdala, but it's small. Okay, whoops, I've gone ahead, wait a minute. Yeah, all right, here on the left you have two and three are the mammillary bodies and the floor of the uh, hypothalamus. And in a, in a CTE case on the right with the red arrow, you can see that the floor has disappeared. That's an artifact of brain removal, but it was very thin, so it broke. And then you can see the little bumps. Let me see if I can do this again. The little bumps here are the, what's left of the mammary bodies, right here and here. So they're, they're atrophic and the floor is gone. This is commonly seen in, in repetitive head trauma, dementia pugilistica, or CTE. Microscopic features, okay. Tau is a, is a, is a cytoskeletal protein that is a MAP, or microtubule associated protein. In neurodegenerations, it is misfolded and hyperphosphorylated. And we have antibodies that recognize that. They won't recognize normal tau. They'll recognize the misfolded hyperphosphorylated one. And by the way, it's only recently that I really, really, it's misfolded in such a way that it's an amyloid. Okay, so it is an amyloid. It's a, it's a beta pleated sheet and it will stain with Congo red and stuff like that. Okay, a number of disorders are recognized as being associated with tau cytopathology and you can see them all right there. Um, this is one of the other problems with this whole field, which is that tau cytopathology is a, probably, a final common pathway of all sorts of brain injury, okay? So, so you can't, there isn't anything particularly specific about hyperphosphorylated beta pleated sheet tau. It, it, it's a final common pathway, so there are not very, there are people, and I will point out one of them to you later, that don't give neuropathologists very much credit and just say, well, NFTs are NFTs. Um, but the distribution of NFTs uh, allows us to distinguish between a lot of these different things. I'll also mention that the distribution of NFTs in CTE 
bear some resemblance to two other acquired tauopathies, post-encephalitic Parkinsonism and the Parkinson dementia complex of Guam. Okay, so for some reason, acquired tauopathies seem to have this distribution. Okay, it's a rule of my guild that I have to bore people with what these things look like. Here you go. <laughs> Alzheimer's, neuritic plaque. Okay, here's the neuritic plaque over here. It's a Bielshowski or a silver stain. The neurites are these black stumpy things. And uh, the roughening in brown is, is the plaque as a whole. This, this central thing that's kind of dark brown is a, most likely an amyloid core, okay? So this is what neuritic plaques look like. This is really the hallmark uh, lesion of Alzheimer's disease, okay? This is a H&E, whoops, this is an H&E of a tangle, a neurofibrillary tangle in a neuron, a pyramidal shaped neuron, okay? And it can be recognized at much higher power, you have to go to high power to see this, uh, by uh, parallel skeins of purplish uh, filamentous material, okay? At lower power, if you do a silver stain, you can see them because they're black and uh, they look like these things right here, or this. In a, when they fill up a pyramidal neuron, they look sort of like flames on a candle. That's, so people tend to think of them as flame shaped. Now, CTE may have AD type changes as a comorbid pathology, but the NFT are completely different in how they're distributed in the brain. They, they, they'll look like this, okay, but they're not in the same places in AD as they are in CTE. And they are also present in both neurons and astrocytes. In AD, NFTs are not present in astrocytes, okay? Now, this is one of uh, McKee's big, uh, big publications. She collected and analyzed 85 brains. Now, these brains were sent to her by people for a reason. We don't necessarily know what the reason is all the time, but this is a fact you've got to keep in mind. She developed and applied criteria for diagnosis, and she developed and applied a staging system for CTE evaluation. Now, in this group, and, and again, this is part of the reason why this is a complicated subject. There was a lot of co comorbid and diagnosable coexisting diseases. 12 out of 103, or 12%, Lewy body disease, usually Parkinson's disease. 13 out of 103, motor neuron disease, or ALS. 13 out of 105, Alzheimer's disease, no, 15, excuse me. And six out of 105, frontotemporal lobar dementia. That's about, it's not quite, but it's about half the cases. So half the cases have, have a coexisting other potentially dementing disorder in them. Okay, th this is, this is I, I, I freely admit it, this is complicated. So the McKee criteria, and I'll show you in a moment, but the, but the key one is the first one. Perivascular foci of phosphotau immunoreactive neurofibrillary tangles and astrocytic tangles in the neocortex. And then the other ones are, are basically elaborations on that. This can be, um, in, should be in the depths of the, of the uh, cerebral sulci. It can be in the superficial layers uh, in the, uh, and it can be subpeel and, and other places, okay? And I'll show you this. So a subsequent paper by McKee et al. basically has, has narrowed this down to just this. Okay, and this is what it looks like, and I haven't seen a case of CTE, but I've seen hundred, more than 100 cases of AD, and I have never seen this, okay? You don't see this in AD, okay? So, I can guarantee you that pathologists can tell the difference between these two entities, and this is the most common confounding, dementing entity, all right? And this is another nice illustration from McKee. This is from the Handbook of Clinical Neurology. By the way, I have a list of virtually, I hope it's all, I think it's all, all the references that I'm referring to that you can have at the end of this talk, okay? Or you can have it now, if you can find it. The pathognomonic lesion consists of these P-tau things, and, wait, wait, so it starts out like this, and here's the sulcus right here, coming right down here. So there, there's a little bit of immunohistochemically positive phosphotau 
right there in the depth of a sulcus. And then as it, see, and here's the sulcus right here. So you can see it's accentuated at the depth and then it starts to spread out. And even here where it's all over the place, there's more staining here at the depth of the sulcus and here at the depth of this sulcus than there is elsewhere. So the accentuation is at the depth of the sulcus, not a pattern that is seen with any other of the, of the disorders that I've already listed for you. So I think this is the same thing we've already shown you, and I want to get on to the epidemiology. But here are the four sorts of things. Perivascular, depth of sulcus, subpeel, and then you get NFTs in the superficial cortex, not in the deep cortex, and I'll show you the comparison to AD. And, and here, here these things are. So the difference is, and, and, and so let me just set this up. If you're gonna be confused, you know, there are things about Parkinson's disease that are a little confusing, and Parkinson's disease and AD co overlap and are comorbid pretty often. PSP has neurofibrillary tangles. It's very rare, and it doesn't tend to feature NFTs in the cortex. It tends to fe feature them in the deeper gray structures. And I could go on and on, but it, it's not my job to teach in neuropathology. What I want to say is that Alzheimer's disease is by far the most common neurodegenerative disorder that leads to dementia. By far, uh, 60 to 80 percent of dementia is due to this. Okay, and if you look at all the blue things here, these are all things that are strikingly different between CTE and Alzheimer's disease, and no neuropathologist is going to have trouble distinguishing these two disorders. So I'm not going to go through it. I'm just going to say again, not a problem. Okay. In CTE, axons stain positive for phosphotau. That doesn't happen. In AD, you don't have accentuation. So you see up here, tangles get spread around. In uh, CTE, they're accentuated at the depth of a sulcus and they're subpeal. I'll also mention, again, the, the really characteristic thing in AD isn't tangles in the, in the cortex, it's plaques, and you don't see them here. Again, in AD, the tangles are in layers three and five. In CTE, they're in layers two and three, different, different distributions. Same thing. They're present in the mammillary bodies in CTE, they're never present in the mammillary bodies in uh, Alzheimer's disease, as shown here. All right. And then uh, this again is just a, sort of a McKee's conception of the progression of, of uh, this source. Now, I got to say, and okay, so let me just show you. So th the upper one here is McKee's conception of progression of this, and the, in Alzheimer's disease, Brock staging. Okay, so the first place that tangles show up in, in, uh, AD is in the entorhinal cortex right down here. The last place they show up is in the entorhinal cortex in, in CTE. Now, I, 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 gotta, I gotta tell you, a pathologist is somebody who when you show them one of these in a sort of a young person and you show them one of these in an older person, no, no, wait a minute, I got it backwards. When you show them one of these in a young person and you show them one of these in an old person, a pathologist is someone who will tell you that these invariably turn over time into these. They'll tell you that a pinky will turn into an index finger over time because we only get to sample things once. Okay, so, so you, this, is one of the, this is one of the frailties of pathology as a field, okay? You, we only get to autopsy people once. So we, we, we consistently are prone to thinking that this has to turn into this. But that isn't necessarily true. I'm, I'm just saying. Okay, so this guy, I don't like this paper. This guy basically says that because NFTs occur in all these disorders, that none of these disorders exist. Okay, they're all Alzheimer's disease or aging. He's an idiot, okay? But this is a much better thing. These guys uh, are taking a much better approach to this. And what they're basically saying is, we don't have any disease. We don't have any disease characteristics that match up with this. We don't have any prospective data about any of this. We don't know how many, we, don't, we absolutely don't know 
how many concussions any of these people have had because they're incentivized not to let anybody know how many concussions they've had. We don't know how many drugs these people have taken because they're incentivized not to allow people to know how many drugs they've taken. We don't know anything about this population at all, uh, and they're a very unusual population. They are driven, they're probably physiologically uh, more robust and completely unusual, they've got unusual mental characteristics, they're really different, and we don't know anything about this, okay? So now I'm gonna go, go into the, and I agree with that, that is certainly true. I mean, the pathology is the pathology, but at this point, it's a pathology in search of a distinctive clinical syndrome, okay? I mean, we've got a syndrome, and by definition, a syndrome is something that has multiple potential etiologies. What we need to do is somehow figure out in advance what signs, symptoms, or even lab tests might lead us to figure out which people are going to deposit all this phospho tau in their, in their head and whether they're actually related. Okay, so to sort of back off just a little bit of the little finger, big finger thing, it is true that there's, in general, in the cases that we have examined the brains in, which again is a highly biased database, that the longer that you play football, the, the, the more phospho tau you find in, in the people's brains that get submitted for examination. Okay, that's number one. Now, the Zuckerman critique is that we have a huge amount of ascertainment bias, which is obvious. All these people are sending their brains to, to Anne McKee because the people were acting peculiar prior to their death. Uh, all the other NFL players uh, aren't sending their brains to Anne McKee, and they weren't acting peculiar prior to their death. The, all the con concussion information is basically from relatives, not from medical people. The autopsy brain population is not representative of the American population playing football. Substance use disorders are noted in two-thirds of those included in the study, but we don't really have very good data about that, and again, it's, it's hard to tell. All of McKee's stuff basically doesn't have any comparison group at all, and, and, and I, I uh, definitely sympathize with this. A single focus of P-tau, and they say this, a single, that, one, that one thing that I showed you with this, that one little bit of brown stuff, that gets the diagnosis made in the most recent studies, one. Now, one of the first things I learned came, coming out of residency from, from my first boss was, if it's real, it repeats. I don't know whether this comes, I don't know whether there's any correlate in clinical uh, science, but in pathology, you know, if, if you go running around diag diagnosing, oh, uh, tumors in living people because you see one bizarre nucleus, you're going to be up a creek in a hurry. So, you know, you need, you, you need to see something uh, more often than once, I think, in order to, to, uh, to bet your career on it. Now, in a dead person, it's a lot easier because, because you don't, you're, you're really not betting very much. But, but, I, but I strongly believe that something that's real repeats. Okay, so now we're going to get into the epidemiology because this, I actually think this is really interesting. So the cardiologists, of course, got into the, got into the game first. Body mass index, playing position, race, and cardiovascular mortality of retired professional football players. And what basically happened here, and I'm not an epidemiologist, as you'll quite easily detect here, is that um, they took about 3,500 players who had been vested in the NFL pension fund, which keeps pretty good track of them. Okay, because if you're in a pension fund, you know when they die because you stop paying the pension, among other things, right? Um, in 1959 through 1988. So they could do person risk years accumulated and uh, until the, either they died or the end of the study, which was in 2007. And they could uh, also collect uh, vital status from pension data, social security, national death index, et cetera, et cetera. And they could compare it, c compare it to a gigantic data set, which is c compiled by the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health, and they can stratify it into five-year intervals by U.S. race and cost and a lot of other things, BMI and other things, okay? In 119 different causes of death, so they, they have manner and mechanism of death, and then they calculate what are called obser uh, observed to expected death as a standardized mortality ratio. Anybody 
want to speculate as to what, what the result of this was in overall or in any particular category? All right. Way better in everything. Way better in everything. So you take a look at this. They have half the expected mortality of any, of any age-adjusted group. Well, that's not surprising. They're elite athletes, right? I mean, they've spent their formative years. You know, anyway, you, you, you can figure this out. So if you look at it, I, I don't get this one, okay? Hodgkin disease. All right, I don't know. I would have expected non-Hodgkin's lymphomas to be up because people that take steroids, they get non-Hodgkin's lymphomas. But Hodgkin disease, I don't get. Anyway, so if you look at this, even their cardiovascular rates aren't particular up. Suicide, half, less than half. Um, the only one that's up a little bit, and it's not statistically, if you look at the confidence interval, it, it overlaps one. Uh, diseases of the nervous system and sense organs, okay? But nada, okay? Really, there's nothing here to worry about, except, of course, for the fact that you're dealing with a very strange population. So let's go into this a little further. The sub-analysis, they did multivariate analysis, including BMI, position plate, age, race, length of time, blah, blah, blah. And the results of a multivariate analysis suggested that those players in the non-speed positions, line, offensive, defensive line, uh, anybody with a higher than, a BMI greater than 30, had higher CVD mortality. And um, CVD, mortality, CVD mortality went down as time went on because in the general population, it's been going down. And then adjusting for everything else, I thought this was kind of funny. There was some evidence of increased risk for defensive linemen compared to everybody else, including offensive linemen, which I thought was kind of funny. I can't explain that. They can't explain it. Okay, now, this is very interesting. So there was a hint of something going on with nervous system stuff. So they took the same data set and reanalyzed it. Only this time they went in and they looked at what are called multiple cause of death certificates rather than just looking at the primary cause of death that was listed in there. Because when you have Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease, it's rarely listed as the cause of death. Usually when you die of Alzheimer's disease, you die of pneumonia or a decubitus ulcer or urinary tract infection. Those are the, probably the big three. But frequently, uh, Alzheimer's disease gets listed as one of the other things, okay? And also, CTE is not in the international classification of diseases. So you can't list it as a cause of death, okay? It's not possible, all right? So it won't go in the database. So, so they reanalyzed it like that and they just included every neurodegenerative thing, figuring that if they had a neurodegenerative thing that was confused with CTA, it would wind up being in one of those. And, now underlying means it's the primary cause of death, Contributing means, well, in this, in this column, they add the underlying to the contributing, and so that's all of them, whether underlying or contributing. And you'll see that, according to this analysis, neurodegenerative disorders are three times more common in NFL players than the general population. This is NIOSH data again, okay? So it's three times more common, and that's currently what's the accepted number. So NFL players don't get very many diseases or don't die of very many things more than the general population. But they're three times more likely to die of neurologic disorders than the general population. That's very interesting. I cannot answer that, but it's consistent. Um, look at that. I mean, and ALS is much rarer than AD or PD. And, and you'll notice there were a bunch of ALS's comorbid in, in McKee's cases. So this is consistent. It, and this is an unanswered question, Jack. I, I don't know the answer to that. Now, obvious problem with all this decreased mortality across the board. These are elite athletes. They're probably born with better physiologies, better constitutions. They train during their youth and early adulthood for hours a day. Best equipment, best advice, possibly the best nutrition. Why wouldn't they have all-cause mortality? Now, I, I love this. I love this. In 1987, a player strike necessitated replacing all NFL players with substitute players for three games. 
okay? Presumably, these guys are real athletes, pretty good shape, pretty good constitution, okay? And they played three games. So this paper compared how, what their mortality is like and, and bracketed players from five years before and five years after to those uh, 879 players, okay? Is, it, is this a cool idea or what? Yeah? All right, so they couldn't find any statistically different difference in all-cause mortality, but there weren't very many events, and this is probably a type two error. But look at this. The career NFL players, this is, this is a Kaplan-Meier curve in death. I mean, this looks like if they can follow this long enough or if they just had four days, or four games or five games of, <laughs> of difference or something, I don't know. Um, this looks like it's gonna become uh, statistically different. And look at this. Look at that. There aren't any neurological deaths in the, in the uh, guys who played three games and there are seven and a half, seven and a half, wait a minute, wait a minute. Oh, seven, which is 5%. So few deaths. Uh, and look at this too, all seven neurological deaths listed were, Jack, motor neuron disease. That's really, that's really striking. That is really, really striking. Okay, good, time for conclusions. I hope that I have convinced you that chronic traumatic encephalopathy, pathologically speaking, is a well-established and specific entity. Um, I haven't said it, but um, McKee put together 25 different uh, cases of pure everything, AD, PD, PSP, CTE, and gave them to other pathologists. She was not involved. She was the coordinator. They were blinded to everything. They just had the slides. They made the diagnosis of CTE with a Cohen's camp of about uh, 0.8, okay? And, if, and then if you gave them uh, either the gross or the clinical, it went up from there. So I mean, just com without just the slides, the Cohen's kappa was 0.8. If you gave him any information, which is how you do autopsies, it became much better than that. I mean, the autopsy is is the classic clinical pathological correlative exercise. You know, giving them slides without telling them what happened to the patient is the ultimate in tying both hands behind your back. Uh, so you know. Second, the diagnosis can only be made by autopsy, so what we have now has, is, is, is a completely biased sample. There, I mean, you can't, you can't generalize about anything having to do with incidence of prevalence, N nothing. No valid clinical phenotype has been established. The disease entity that corresponds to the pathology is probably pretty rare. I think this is kind of interesting in that now, now I'm a parent, my kids are all grown up, but you know, I wouldn't let my kids play football. But the simple fact of the matter is, there's a panic uh, 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 in the uh, abroad that sort of has, where everybody sort of has the feeling that if you play football, you're gonna get CTE and you're gonna commit suicide. You know, but I've shown you the epidemiology of this. And I mean, at a minimum, that's overstating the case. It, it, it's, it's clear that, that this disorder exists, but it, it clearly can only be uh, afflicting a fraction of the people that play contact sports, and not just football, but everything, soccer, rugby, basketball, baseball, um, you know, and we need to figure out, you know, what the risk factors are. And, and furthermore, I think maybe it, it may be an interaction between certain kinds of people and, and drugs. I mean, we, we don't know about anabolic steroids. We don't know about, uh, we don't know about various other socioeconomic variables, and we, all of which, are actually shrouded in mystery because um, NFL players, by and large, don't, don't want you to know about them. The generation of phospho tau is a final common pathway of numerous pathogenetic sequences. So in terms of basic science research, understanding how uh, tau gets hyperphosphorylated and misfolded will have implications for every one of these neurodegenerative diseases, and this seems like a topic that is quite important. Furthermore, 
the whole amyloid hypothesis of Alzheimer's disease uh, is taken on water a little bit, it seems to me, at this point. And, um, and the most consistent correlate of dementia in Alzheimer's disease is tau burden. Uh, so, um, now, don't get me wrong, uh, in the uh, familial cases of Alzheimer's disease, it is unquestionable that the amyloid hypothesis is correct. However, it seems that uh, interrupting the tau cascade uh, might be a, as good or better a uh, therapeutic approach to interrupting, interrupting the amyloid cascade, or at least that's what all the recent therapeutic trials would suggest. And the disease entity that corresponds to CTE is probably multifactorial and clearly requires more study. If uh, patriotism is the last refuge of the scoundrel, then I would suggest that claiming a disease is multifactorial is the last refuge of the academic uh, clinician or scientist or something because uh, that's what we always wind up saying is this is just really complicated and we need to study it some more. And I think this is just really complicated and we need to study it some more. So um, I've got the references out on a piece of paper if you want to look up any of this stuff. And there's one more on there that's a recent uh, review of neuropathology by Anne McKee from the Handbook of Clinical Neurology. It's gorgeous. I mean, the illustrations are gorgeous. And she's, she really, she's the, the leader of this field. And that's it. I'll take questions. Greg. Uh, I have a technical thing. You, you mentioned about tau showing up in neurons and astrocytes, but you didn't say anything about other cells. And you, in, amongst the neurons, it looked like it was, uh, you showed a pyramidal neurons, which are glutamatergic. Is it in non-glutamatergic neurons in the cortex? And is it also in oligodendrocytes? Why would it be distributed so in other diseases, it can be found in oligodendroglial cells. It has, I, to my knowledge, I have not read of it being expressed in CTE in oligodendroglial cells. It, does, it is expressed in oligodendroglial cells in both cortical basal degeneration and PSP. Um, glutamatergic, I don't believe it's uh, neurotransmitter specific. I've never read that. And uh, the layer two and three neurons probably are not glutamatergic. Do you know the answer to that? Huh? Okay, well, they're, expre they're expressed in layer two and three neurons, so, so no. And, and, and I, I've never read that there's any neurotransmitter specificity to any of these misfolded proteins. So other than, other than uh, well, even there, it's not neurotransmitter specific, Lewy bodies, because they, they're in the, yes, they're in the uh, substantia nigra, but they're also in the dorsal motor neuron F10, which is a different neurotransmitter. And the locus ceruleus, which is another neurotransmitter. Any other questions? Jack. Your growth slides <clears throat> early on showed that, you know, growth changes in mammillary bodies and, and along the base of the brain. Do you think that is potentially related to shear trauma? From, is there any suggestion that that might be? Um, I, yeah, I think I, it's, it's one of two things. It's either that or it's the fact that advanced cases uh, involve atrophy of medial temporal lobe, which then means that you're involving um, the uh, limbic structures, which are all connected to each other, and, so, and rather prone to transsynaptic degeneration. So the, the, it, it doesn't take much to get, well, the cingulate gyrus is hooked up to the hippocampus and the, and the cingulate gyrus is hooked up to the mammillary bodies. So, I mean, once, once you get all that stuff degenerating, they all, I think they'll all go down together. Uh, but also rubbing against the, the uh, you know, rubbing against the uh, nearby skull is another possibility. I don't know the answer to the question, but those are the two possibilities that come to mind. 
was, is it in your case stories at the beginning, suicide was sort of a recurring and, o and Bennett Omalu has made that a big part of his story. But in the data, the epidemiologic data you showed, it didn't seem to be. No. In fact, in one of them, it seemed, I think, the risk was 0.4. Yeah, yeah. See, so I think, I think that, that that's something that Omalu is probably doing that's incorrect. I mean, th there's a lot of fear about this, I think. Um, you know, and a lot of these people, that's not true either. Some of the people that have died violently are actually free of any drugs when they've died this way. Uh, it's, you know, the stories are kind of interesting. So that guy Grimsley, he was having trouble with short-term memory. His wife or his family were gone and he was an avid hunter. And he, um, he put out newspaper on the uh, dining room table and got his gun cleaning stuff out and shot himself in the chest. And that was ruled uh, by the coroner an accidental death. And uh, I've, I've had experience with this. I, I'm administratively over the forensic center here, but I'm not a forensic guy. But I've been dragged into some fairly heated disputes when the forensic medical examiner rules something a suicide. And, and that's a very interesting topic all by itself. But the National Association of Medical Examiners has guidelines which, if you read between the lines, sort of suggest that when you point a gun at yourself and pull the trigger, regardless of what your frame of mind might be, that it's probably best to, uh, to uh, classify it as a suicide for uniformity of record keeping purposes. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm gonna go back and ask, I just found this out this morning about this guy. So I'm gonna go ask my medical examiners what they would do if they found a guy with all his gun cleaning equipment out and had pointed a gun at himself and pulled the trigger. Because of course, you know, you know, rule one of gun safety is you never point a gun at anything you don't intend to shoot. And rule number two, of course, is you never pull the trigger after you do that. Uh, so it's a very interesting problem. Why would you be claiming the load? Well, that's, that's, that's so far back in the rules that, I mean, I mean you know, so, but, but it's interesting the sorts of arguments you get from decedents' families over this. So it, it's, it's just interesting. Doesn't that mean then for the epidemiologists that you listed that suicide could be underrecorded because of all of those issues with the coroners or calling it the cause of death? Yes, well, so that's what I'm saying is, I mean, so my people are catching holy hell about this. And, and in fact, there was a law passed recently in Tennessee, a really dumb law, that said that you can appeal the decision of a coroner about this. Um, this is a terrible idea. This is like going to a doctor and getting all worked up, you know, and the doctor says, you've got lung cancer, and, and you say, I don't believe that. Give me another diagnosis. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's a terrible idea. Uh, you know, the, the correct thing to do is to just take the relevant data and go to some other doctor and see if that person will give you a different diagnosis. But you, you can't ask somebody who's made a diagnosis to change that diagnosis because you don't like it. That, that's not a good idea. And yet, that's sort of what we've just done in this state. So if, if that works out the way the law of unintended consequences nearly always works out, no one will ever make a diagnosis of suicide in the state anymore. And yet the purpose of having a medical examiner is accurate death classification. Ta-da. Greg, you want? within a large group of people that all get exposure to head trauma, that you're going to have different outcomes. Right, right. right. Genetic makeup. Or right. But it's, it's, what's surprising is that there, and maybe you explained this initially, is that there seems to be no attempt to look for correlations with the severity of injury in those large studies. Because you would think that the, the people who have the most severe 
greatest injury are going to be the most prone to neurological disorders later. There seems to be some correlation with length of service in the NFL, okay? But the, the people have focused on concussion for some reason, probably good reason, but the problem is, well, the problem is that um, concussions are not well documented in the NFL or in college, and the, the athletes have good reason, they think, for hiding their concussions. Until just recently, they would deny symptoms and deny, you know, and again, the concussion does, doesn't have to involve a loss of consciousness, okay? Mm -hmm. So people are always talking in the old days about getting their bell rung, and that just meant they were confused. They had a slight alteration in their mental state. That was a concussion, by today's standards, that's a concussion, but they would deny it. So they wouldn't be taken out of the game. And, the, and then they would deny the post-concussion syndromes as well, which frequently are, are little more than a headache, say, a, con, a, a, con, a, a, a continuous headache for a week. They would deny that. And so it's hard to get that data. And, and you know, I remember watching a game. I'm from St. Louis. I don't remember whether they were the St. Louis Rams or the Los Angeles Rams. And this, this quarterback named Case Keenum, and they had a neurologist on the sideline, and they had guys up in the, in the booth and this guy, Case Keenum, he was tackled not terribly hard. He fell backwards, hit the back of his head on the turf. And I was sitting in my living room, and I could tell he was concussed. He got up. He was shaky. He, he held his head. He's kind of going like this. You know, he got up. He, they had to show him where to stand behind the center. He, he received the ball, and he fumbled. And... Nobody stopped anything, and there was, they had rules in place at that time where they were supposed to have neurologists and people by, and sports trainers looking for this kind of behavior, and they let him play. So, you know, so the answer is the data is not available, and it's not available because nobody wants it to be available at this point. How does the CTE pathology in this group compare with what's found in Military oh, I didn't talk about that. It's it's very similar. So so and it's interesting because there's a more control. You know they are and when it happens. Yes. The problem that with that is that almost all military men have played contact sports. Oh. Um, so 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 but yes, uh, but it's very similar. Um, very similar. And I have been asked to review papers. Uh, where um, uh, individuals have had well-documented single instances of what I think would have to be called severe rather than mild TBI, and they've had all kinds of abnormalities in their brains that didn't correspond to this, but all kinds of everything, all the things that I've sort of been de describing, and, and not any single thing, just you know, years later. I mean, and they were followed carefully and all that. I mean, it's clear that Head trauma can produce a wide variety of pathology, a wide variety of pathology, a single episode, wide variety of, of changes in the brain. Single episode. Another thing that's very interesting is with regard to that perivascular thing, there's one study from a British brain bank and some really famous British neuropathologists. They went back and they looked at people who had one episode of hospitalized head trauma. Could be concussions, could be worse and they got the paraffin blocks out, and they stained for immunoglobulins. It could have been a couple of weeks before death, could have been 20 years after, after the concussion or whatever. They stained for immunoglobulins around the vessels. Okay, now immunoglobulins are not typically allowed beyond the blood-brain barrier. So 20 years later, you know, if everything was fine, you wouldn't expect to be able to find them. They found them. Okay, I mean, so the blood-brain barrier apparently never recovers from a single episode of head trauma. Does this they, relate to the ALS finding? I don't know. I have not seen a single sensible speculation about ALS. I, I don't. I, I'm not even sure I've seen a speculation about ALS. We just heard one. But was oh that one? You think? Yeah. yeah I don't know. I don't know. Is is um, head trauma? Absolutely. For dementia? Absolutely. Well, I mean for ALS. 
Uh, well, let's put it this way. Lou Gehrig, 2,200 straight games playing without a miss, and then a bunch of these guys. I mean, there's a lot of people who were physically, shall we say, over the top that I think have come down with ALS. I, I would say that extreme competitiveness and whatnot has, has produced ALS in some people. It's a correlation anyway. I mean, people who, you know, refuse to let their bodies rest. I think you can find a fair number of people like that, maybe. I don't know. Lou Gehrig's disease, yeah. I'm keeping you late. Thank you again. <laughs>